Good morning, church. Is this thing on? All right. It is good to be with you this morning as we gather together in the month of August at 9 a.m. for Beverly Heights Together. I want to welcome you and welcome any visitors or guests that we might have this morning. We will begin worship in just a little bit. You'll notice from the bulletin that uh, this morning we have our welcome and greeting and announcements. No psalm instruction this morning as uh, Alyssa and her family are away this weekend, uh, but we will uh, return to that next week and then on Labor Day weekend as we finish out our summer schedule and practices for the summer. But for now, I'd like to invite you to stand and to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. Tell them that you're glad to see them. If you could begin to make your way back to your pews, we'll invite Amy Lucas to come now and bring us our morning announcements. Good morning. Welcome to Beverly Heights. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. I don't normally bring props for my announcements, but the lost and found was overflowing. And so I am letting you know that outside my office, there are about 25 water bottles and maybe 25 sweatshirts, uh, as well as some pants. We're not quite sure how you lost them here, but somehow you did. Um, there's a variety of options, um, and so I, I invite you after the service on your way downstairs to swing by my office and just peruse what's there, see if you lost anything. Maybe there's a water bottle or a coffee mug that you've been missing, and it's here. So we invite you to check that out on your way out. And then uh, I have one other announcement, and it is from Todd Loises. Good morning, church. Um, I want to make an announcement, uh, announcement this morning on behalf of choir. Uh, we want to invite you to, to join us. Um, beginning September 7th, we'll have our first practice at 630. Uh, we'll have some dessert and uh, some extended introduction and a preview of the season from 7 to 9. Um, I do want to share on a personal note that I have never before coming to Beverly Heights sung in choir. And it was a little bit of an intimidating thing for me, but um, our choir is very gracious, and Alyssa is just an awesome teacher. So if uh, during the summer learning your parts, you've been encouraged and maybe even stirred that for the first time you could learn your part, and um, I'm speaking probably to a lot of the guys uh, who try to sing a bass part just singing the melody low, which is not actually the bass part. Um, but I, I just want to encourage you to use the internal instrument that God has given all of us to praise him. And so uh, if that sounds like something that you're interested in, Please join us on uh, Thursday, September 7th. And there's no, there's no big solo that you have to give. There's no, uh, no audition. You just come and be part of the sound. And uh, so thanks. Well, as, uh, as I indicated earlier, there, was, there is no psalm instruction, but we will have the opportunity at the beginning of the service as part of our intro to attempt to sing when Zion's fortunes God restored, which has been the uh, second of the two psalms with uh, four-part harmonies that we've been learning over the summer. I think uh, you guys have sounded tremendous and wonderful, and it's been a blessing to me having a unique position at the front of the 
uh, sanctuary to hear the wonderful music and the wall of sound that comes forward. And I think that we have an opportunity not only to uh, present to the Lord a wonderful offering in song, but also to demonstrate to Alyssa that even without her, we can muster some kind of music together. So let's try to attempt that. Uh, it'll be a wonderful uh, intro to the Lord. But I'd like to invite our flute trio to come as they play the prelude and as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. If you would please now take your bulletin and join with me in our invitation to worship. Rejoice in the Lord always. Our congregational introit is, as I've already indicated, Psalm 126, which is found towards the back of the summer psalter. If you would take your summer psalter and turn with me to when Zion's fortunes God restored. I think we'll stand as a congregation and sing verse 1. Remind you that our sopranos come in first, then our altos, then our tenors and basses. I'll do my best to lead you in if I can. I'm not, I'm not as skilled, but I'll do my best. And Holly, sing out loud for the sopranos. Okay. <laughs> with me as we pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, it is our delight to be in your presence this day, to rejoice in you, to worship you, to glorify your great name. We pray, Lord, that you would be kind toward us and bountiful with your presence, that you would come to us, draw near to us as we draw near to you. May we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and remember his saving work for us on the cross. And to remember 
the commission that he gave to us to be his disciples, to serve your great purposes for your kingdom as we seek to make the nations into disciples as well. So we pray your blessing upon us this day, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our opening psalm of praise is Psalm 100E. You'll find it adjacent to our introit. We'll worship together. of reading taken from Psalm 132. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. As we enter into the presence of Almighty God this morning, as we enter into His courts with praise, with joy, and with thanksgiving, we also have the opportunity to recognize who we are in the light of who God is, and God is holy. And we, because of sin, are not. Yet, God is gracious and invites us to confess our sin before Him to be touched by him, cleansed and healed by grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you would join with me now in our unison confession of sin, after which we will spend time in silent and private confession. Joining together, O oh Lord, as long as I am apart from you, I am self-satisfied because I have no standard by which to measure my low stature. But when I come near to you, there, for the first time, I see myself. In your light, I behold my darkness. In your purity, I behold my corruption. My very confession of sin is the fruit of holiness. O oh, divine man, let me gaze on you more and more until, in the vision of your brightness, I loathe the sight of my impurity. 
until in the blaze of that glory which human eye has not seen, I fall prostrate, blinded, broken, to rise again anew in you. Amen. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me as we pray? Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity. We recognize, even as we have confessed, that our confession of sin is the fruit of your holiness at work in our lives, in our hearts. And so we come to this moment in the service, we come to this moment in our lives, not with despondency, not with fear, but with gratitude that you have invited us to confess, that you have invited us to have our burdens removed. You have invited us to be cleansed. And so now, Lord, in the quietness of our hearts, we search our hearts and our minds, and we bring before you our sins. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have sent to us your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and served. He lived and he died. He gave his life as a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice, in order that our sins might be forgiven. We thank you, Lord, that you send to us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in all truth, to regenerate our hearts in order that we might be saved and to minister to us that peace and that blessed assurance that because Christ Jesus has died and because he has risen and because he ascended on high and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, we know that the work is finished that our salvation is secure, and that by grace, forgiveness is ours. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join with me now in our unison assurance of pardon taken from Ephesians chapter 1, joining together. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. Because Jesus Christ came and gave his life for us, our sins are forgiven. They are forgiven indeed. Thanks be to God and all God's people said. Amen. As we confess our sin, we also have the opportunity to confess our faith, to practice our faith, and to grow in strength in what it is that we believe and what it is that we trust in. And so I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue to worship through song as we sing now Psalm 30, O Lord, I will exalt you. Testament lesson this morning is taken from the book of Nehemiah. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles or to take a pew Bible and turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 9. Direct your attention to verse 6 through 21. It speaks of the people of God who are gathered under the ministry of Ezra and Nehemiah. The work that God was doing in restoring the people after their exile, as they confessed their sin before God and the promise that God would do mighty and wonderful things through them in the land. Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. Nehemiah writes, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host." the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name of Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, And the Girgashites, and you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of your fathers in Egypt, and heard their cry at the Red Sea, and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. 
And you made a name for yourself, as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way to which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and the law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You and your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll remain seated but continue to worship and sing verses 4 and 5 of O Lord, I Will Exalt You.
Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Delighted to be able to invite this morning Scott Boyd to our pulpit. Scott is the director of the Pittsburgh Region International Student Ministries. He and his wife, Lisa, are with us this morning, long-standing friends of our congregation. And PRISM is a long-standing mission partner with this church, having been started by uh, Dr. Templin, Dr. Carl uh, Templin, a number of years ago, along with his wife, Pat. And we've been delighted to be in partnership with them for many, many years. And many of you know that we've been collecting furniture for the garage giveaway. And uh, Scott is fresh off of that event just yesterday. I'm sure he is uh, almost dead on his feet. I know it was a long day, but he's been gracious and kind and willing to come and to uh, share a little bit of that experience with us and to open up the Word of God. So, Scott, if you would come, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. When we returned from the mission field, one of the things I said I wouldn't miss was moving uh, furniture all the time. And uh, God had a sense of humor to give me this ministry of helping every international student that comes to Pittsburgh move their furniture. Um, but we, uh, we served four to 500 students. I, I lost, we lost track after about 400 yesterday. And it was truly amazing to see the joy of all the students. Just knowing, I think what was, they were happy about is not so much the stuff they got, as just being surprised that somebody had thought about them even before they arrived. <laughs> and I think that speaks volumes of the church in Pittsburgh. Um, how people came together from many churches to give stuff, but to be there, to welcome them. And it was just a joyous occasion. PRISM, okay, I'm never going to forgive Carl Templin for giving it that name because international students say it like prison. It's, 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 it's not prison ministry, it's PRISM. Um, and so Pittsburgh Region International Student Ministries. Um, it's really, this was the second phase of our ministry with you. I want to say you've been with us since 1993. My wife and I went to Slovenia and you supported us, you were our commissioning church to send us overseas to do a church planting ministry for about 10 years in Slovenia. And then when Dr. Templin, Carl Templin retired, we came back to uh, take over the leadership of PRISM. So that's been now 21 years. <laughs> so it's been a, a long journey and you've been with us every step of the way through, uh, through our time in Slovenia and now here with PRISM. Our mission at PRISM is this, I just wanted to read this for you, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to Pittsburgh area international students, visiting scholars, and their families to the end that they will be identified, befriended, and led to a personal relationship with Christ and discipled for service to Christ in his kingdom. The real success stories of a ministry like this are not so much what happens while they're here, but what happens when they go home to places we'll never get to. This is a reverse way of doing missions. Instead of us going there, we're reaching them who've come here. And missions by nature always involves crossing barriers, and, and barriers of language, barriers of distance, barriers of culture, and they've they've crossed all those barriers. They've learned our language. They've come from foreign lands. They've, um, they're eager to learn American culture. And now our job is to welcome them and to share the good news of Christ with them while they're here. Uh, it looked like this yesterday. I'll show you a little picture of uh, the bedlam <laughs> that took place, but it was controlled chaos. And uh, the students got their stuff. About 25 truck drivers kept taking them back to their apartments. And uh, you know, they were just so surprised that not only they, we gave them the stuff, but we helped them get it back to their apartment. And it was really, a, it's really our first opportunity to communicate God's grace to students. There are about 13,000 international students in Pittsburgh. At this event, 80% of them were from India. India is now 11th on the world watch list of most persecuted nations uh, because of Hindu radicalism in various parts of, of, of India. And just to have an opportunity to, our, our ministry's kind of shifted, I would say, from, from many Chinese students, and because of politics and various other 
things, fewer are coming from China, but many more from, from India. And it's such, I believe it's a time where God wants us to make an impact in, in India. And they come from all regions. As you know, uh, India is very complex culturally, uh, culturally, but they come from many parts and cultures from India to study here. And we have this narrow window of opportunity to share the gospel with them. Um, at PRISM, it's kind of like, I would say PRISM is like a funnel. It's, it's at the top of the funnel is the garage giveaway. We just meet them. There's really no spiritual content. It's just say, welcome to Pittsburgh. And then we have other welcome events that, uh, that, that, that you know, we can really establish the contact. But then we move them down the funnel. And we get them into an English conversation group where they might meet a Christian or a cooking class or an outdoor activity or our Friday night dinner we call open house and they get some introduction to biblical truth. And then trips, they stay with a Christian family. They, they, they eventually some attend Bible studies or church visits and conferences. And they, the goal is to shoot them out of the funnel to go home to make an impact for Christ where they go. And I can say, after all these, this history of uh, PRISM over the years, probably 20,000 international students have passed through the ministry, and many of them are serving God in different ways where they are. I think of Elizabeth from Colombia, who you will meet. She's coming here in three weeks for like a sabbatical, and I'll bring, bring her here. But she's, uh, she came a Christian in Pittsburgh. She went back to Colombia and decided to leave her career in business to go into full-time ministry, and she's now the director of projects for the whole, her whole denomination of 330 churches in Colombia. And it's all because of faithful Christians in Pittsburgh who shared the gospel with her. I think of Asel in Kazakhstan. She came to faith here. She's back in Kazakhstan. She, too, decided to go into ministry. She's attending seminary at uh, Columbia International. University, and she uh, has led five of her Muslim background family members to faith. And to see that happening on many different fronts. This, Beverly Heights, I always think of your uh, motto to say, uh, be, uh, being gathered and scattered. Well, this is a ministry, PRISM is a ministry of scattering. <laughs> you know, they, we gather them for a while, but then scatter them to various parts of the world. One of the great blessings we have in the ministry is this hospitality house. So we, we decided to um, have a place where students can live when they first come to Pittsburgh. Some students don't know where they're gonna live, so we, they can stay in this beautiful home we now have in Squirrel Hill. And we have Bible studies there, dinners, uh, lots of activities. We can invite students who may not be inclined to go to a Christian church to a home to have Bible studies. To, there's a big yard for yard parties and various activities. There are people there right now from Spain, Brazil, China, and, um, and India. So it's, it's great to have an international home like that. Um, and then we have uh, various activities. Some of you may say, well, how can we connect? You, you may not know all that's going on just a few miles away in Oakland, but it seems like worlds apart in many ways. But there are ways for you to connect. One way is just on our, on our website, you can, you can go there and see how to connect, but there's this one program we have called Prism Connections. And if you, if you go to that application, it'll, it'll um, you just fill out the application and we'll connect you with an inter international student as a friendship partner, or some of you have experience in various fields to be a mentor to an international student. Although they're very smart, a lot of them have no idea where they're going in life. And so they need, uh, many of them are happy to have a mentor or some want to improve their English, just a language partner. So it's called Prism Connections. That's a great way for you uh, to, to make an international friend, to do missions without having to leave home. <laughs> and so let me encourage you to think about that. Um, so let me, let me get over to our text for today. I want to go through Ephesians chapter 5 with you. I love the book of Ephesians because it's just so neatly laid out and structured where the first three chapters are really about how, what God did to secure our salvation. And then the, the, then the last four, four through six chapters are about how then we should live as, as Christians. And so I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. <clears throat> it's going to focus on the topic of walking in love. So 
Uh, let's pray as we, before we read the scriptures. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you're doing to bring the nations to us, especially, Lord, we think of India. Would you reach the most populous nation in the world? You've given us this, this opportunity, Lord, and I pray, God, that we might um, uh, seize the opportunity that you've given us. Show us how to live and to walk as children of light and love, Lord. Let us, uh, as a church, be encouraged by your word today, Lord. Thank you for giving it to us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So follow along as I read from uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become par partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in un the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, as I mentioned, we look at the book of Ephesians in chapters 1 to 3, what God has done to secure our salvation. But now we turn to how are we to live in light of being followers of Christ. It's in the right order, the structure of Ephesians, because it's not that we live in a certain way and therefore we become Christians. It's that we become Christians and therefore we live in a certain way. If, we were, if it were the other way around, then our salvation would depend on us and how we achieved our salvation through our own behavior. But our, our salvation totally depends on Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. And when we receive that, we literally put off the old and put on the new. And th through the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in us and informs us of a new way of living. And that's what Ephesians is talking about, a new way of living motivated by the Holy Spirit. Life becomes an adventure of discovering how we can live a life more pleasing to God. I laugh at those progressive insurance commercials where this sort of nerdy father, I don't know if you remember, is trying to teach a class of, of new homeowners how to not become like their parents. And so he, he, uh, he, tells, uh, he instructs them on how to find the silence button on their phone, things you need to know uh, to not become like your parents. And, and he tells them, uh, guess what? The waiter at the restaurant really doesn't need to know your name. <laughs> you, know, you know, your parents always wanted to have that. But what makes it funny is you know they will become like their parents. And, and it's true, we do take on characteristics of our parents, and I'm sure all of you with children can say, there are times that's really joyful 
to see ways that your children imitate you and, and you can see great things. It can be painful too when you see it at times they imitate some of your weaknesses. But as followers of Christ, we, we have a new father and we start to take on some of his characteristics and that's a new reality. The passage starts with Paul encouraging them. The NIV translation says, be imitators of God as beloved children. You know, that's the very purpose of sanctification is to grow in likeness to God. And the Christian life is designed to move us on to become more like God. And that's why the whole focus of the Christian faith is on Jesus Christ, because God revealed himself through him, through himself, through his son. And that's how we know the Father. And we can't see God the Father, but he made himself known through the Son. And so the scripture tells us who Jesus was and how he lived among the people and how ultimately what he did on the cross. And so the, the four parts we see in our passage today, it's, it's divided into the first section is about walking in love. And the next verses, 8 to 14, are, are talking about walking in light. And then 15 to 18 says walking in wisdom. And then finally walking in joy. So it's really love, light, wisdom, and joy. And that's how it's divided. Walking in love. Let me talk about walking in love. Walking, love is, is greatly emphasized in Ephesians because it's a book about the church. It's about living in, as members of a church. And, and what is needed most in the church is love. A growing understanding of God's love that motivates us to worship. It's out of love that, 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 that our worship flows. And it's love that moves us to care for one another. It's love that drives us to look out to the world, even to international students, and say, where are we going to find the energy to love these people? It's, it's only as, as Christ loved wells up in us that we're able to love one another and love and think outwardly to loving the world, making Christ known in the world. In describing the word love, Paul borrows two uh, technical terms, um, two technical terms from Jewish sacrificial vocabulary to help us define walking in love. The first is offering, which, which has the idea of bringing an offering as part of, of a ceremony. And so we see on the cross, Christ presented himself as an offering. And Paul adds that it was a fragrant offering. It was fragrant. The metaphor suggests that Jesus' sacrifice of his own life, it was pleasing to the Father. And it was accepted as a means of healing the relationship between God and us that was broken because of sin. So it was, it was an offering, but it was also a sacrifice. And this refers to the necessary sacrifice of an animal as a peace offering. There was a recognition that sin could not just be overlooked, but that for the forgiveness of sin required the shedding of blood. And so, so Paul informs them also that there's going to be opposition to them walking in love. It sounds all kind of nice, just let's just walk in love, but it's not easy. And, it's, and, there, and there's opposition to doing that. Satan, our enemy, is always seeking to destroy God's di divine work in his children and to turn them as far away as possible from his image and his will. And he warns them of the dangers, and he, he gets into some warnings about how what can keep you from walking in love. One is um, sexual immorality he mentioned, and there are other places in Scripture. There's a close connection between sexual immorality and other forms of impurity and greed. You see, an immoral person is inevitably a greedy uh, person. And so Paul lets them know that to walk in love, to be cautious in these three areas, sexual immorality and greed and how they speak. It says, let no, no filthiness or foolish talk come out of your mouth. Let there be no crude joking. Instead, instead, let there be thanksgiving. That's the, that's the flip side of, of falling into these areas, is, is let there be thanksgiving. And, and so you see, walking in love is part of 
sanctification. We're growing in it, and God is working. But here's the thing. With sanctification, yeah, God is working, but we've got to work too. That sanctification does depend on, on, our, on us taking charge and saying, God, I know you're at work in my life, but we need to establish godly disciplines in, in ways that where we um, are, are working on our own spiritual growth as God is working. And walking in love, we're growing in it. Um, and, and we have a choice. He says, you have a choice to flee unhelpful people. <laughs> He says, flee unhelpful people. Flee unhelpful influences in your life. The usage of, of, of the internet, the way you interact, the things you look at, the way you spend. Flee unhelpful inter, uh, influences and, and know your vulner, vulnerabilities. He tells them, be aware of your vulnerabilities. That's all part of walking in love. Let me get on to light. Walking in light. <coughs> the theme of light and darkness is something we see throughout the whole Bible. Right from the beginning of creation, darkness was over the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light. Right from creation, God has been speaking light into darkness. And first at creation, but then he gives us these glimpses of light through the Old Testament prophets and priests and kings, and they all fell short of God's holy perfection in one way or another. But they all pointed to the one who would come to be the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, the perfect king. And Jesus came into the world, and John says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see, light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. But it also says the world did not know him, because of spiritual blindness. There is a spiritual blindness. And only when the Spirit opens our eyes can we see that without Christ, we're in darkness. And the passage doesn't just say, you were in darkness. It says, you were darkness. You were darkness. But now you are light. But now you are light. God says that to you that through faith in Jesus Christ, you literally become light. That's amazing that it says that we ourselves can bec become light. God says, um, Jesus said of himself, he said, I am the light of the world. Um, but he also says, don't forget in Matthew that you are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a stand for everyone in the, in the house to be able to see. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. And so, how are we to walk as children of light? How do children of light walk? Well, the passage tells us. He says, we pursue what is good, what is right, what is true. Someone who is walking in the light lives a transparent life. There shouldn't be any secrets in our lives. We're continually pursuing the truth. One of my great heroes <coughs> in Christianity is the great evangelist in American history is George Whitfield, who was actually from uh, England. He was largely influenced by John and Charles Wesley. And he was born in England about uh, 17, in 1714. And when the idea of independence wasn't even on the mind of most Americans, wasn't even a thought. This was long before American independence. But when he arrived in Philadelphia in 1739, he began to preach, walking in the light, walking in the light. And it was uh, when he came there, Benjamin Franklin wrote of him, I knew him for upward of 30 years. His integrity and zeal for prosecuting every good work I have never seen equaled. I shall never see it exceeded. His preaching led to what historians call the first great awakening. Eric, Eric Metaxas <clears throat> talks about um, George Whitfield in his book, and he says, his preaching caused people to look directly upward to God, greatly tempered their fear of worldly authority, and went a long way towards solidifying what we today see as the American character. 
You know, I, I work with these people all over the world. They come here and they wonder, why was America so successful <laughs> economically and in other ways? And I really think it was, it, was, it was the result of the first Great Awakening where so many things were established on biblical truth. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it's trying to be uh, torn down, but we have to make sure it doesn't get torn down because it was, it's really the success of a nation dependent. And George Whitfield proclaimed to people how to walk in the light of Christ. And I wonder what influence we will have on people as we walk in the light. I mean, we may not preach 18,000 sermons like George Whitfield, but your life will speak as you walk in the light. People will see Christ in you and they will wonder about the hope that you have. And so we really, from this passage, have two assignments. The first is trying to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Discernment carries the idea of evaluating facts and evidence to learn what's truly pleasing and honoring to God. Romans 12 puts it this way, uh, that it's only by presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to God that we can know his acceptable will. And we can have the assurance of salvation. When you're passionately seeking what is pleasing to God, you can know that you're a child of God because that comes from Him. That passion to, to discern what is pleasing to God, that, that, that should give you assurance that you indeed are a child of God. And the one who's in the darkness is, on the other hand, self-centered and seeking only what pleases himself. That's the first thing, trying to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The second is to take no part in unfruitful works of darkness. This implies that we have a choice to make. We can choose to dabble with darkness or to flee from it. And not only should we flee darkness, we should seek to expose it. This takes courage. It's not easy to walk in the light in a culture that has many dark influences. That's tough. That's not easy. There's opposition. Don't be surprised by that. Light exposes darkness, and pure and illuminating light of God's Word exposes all the secrets of sin. And evil no longer masquerades as anything else. We see it in our culture. Paul let the light fall on the, world, on the ungodliness of the pagan world in which he lived and exposed it for what it really was. And so he paraphrases Isaiah 60, when he says, uh, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. Isn't that amazing? That when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you could say the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. And uh, that's, that's how we are to walk in the world. And so now in verse 15, there's a shift from, from uh, love and light to wisdom. Uh, talking about wisdom and foolishness. He says, look carefully how you walk, not as wise, but as wise. Biblically speaking, an unwise person is not characterized by a lack of intelligence. The unwise person is characterized by unbelief and, and, and the consequences that flow out of unbelief. Romans describes unbelief by saying they claim to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images re re resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. God is not concerned as much with your, he's not concerned with our IQ as he is with our faith. And, and you can't become a wise person without believing in the God who created everything. Even in our academic institutions like Harvard and other Ivy League colleges, they all had Latin phrases above buildings that indicated that God was supreme over philosophy and the sciences and every other academic field. But somewhere along the way, we decided we were smarter than God and we put our own human reason over God's revelation. And, and a, a wise person will be led to see the brevity of life. And a wise person will will make the best possible use of all circumstances. You know, I, I can't help but think of a couple I know from a church where I'm doing some interim preaching. They were rejoicing over the birth of a new child. And the parents came from India to rejoice 
over that new baby. And the father had a massive heart attack. So one minute, they're rejoicing over this new baby. The next minute, they're grieving over, over the parents, the father who had come from India, passed away from a massive heart attack. And it just, it just reminded me of how quickly circumstances in our lives are constantly changing. I think on a lighter note of uh, a, a last va vacation we had, my wife was, we were on a, 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 one of those simulated surfing machines. And she's from Hawaii, right? So she was trying to show her boys how she could surf. Like mama's still got it on the flow rider. And she did it on her knees and she was doing pretty well on her knees. So she decided to stand up and she's, her boys are going like, wow, mom, that's amazing. And then she went down and she broke her shoulder. <laughs> I, I know it's not funny, but, <laughs> but, 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 but we're all laughing. Um, but like, it was a moment of, of, of joy that just suddenly changed. Life can be like that, where, where, where things are going well and all of a sudden something happens and there's a, there's a constant uh, change. But the, the question for us is how will you glorify God in your current circumstances? Maybe they're joyful, maybe they're hard. Do you have a cause for joy? How are you going to give God the glory in your cause for joy? Or do you have a fear or concern? How will your life point people to God even in a time of fear or concern or uncertainty? The passage closes with joy, walking in joy. He says, as a result of being filled with the Spirit, is that we're moved to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I always love coming here to Beverly Heights where the musical IQ is very high. <laughs> you know, the talent in, in, uh, musically in this church is truly amazing. But I, I don't think it's talking about we have to constantly sing responses to one another, but it does mean that God gives us an attitude of joy. And we look around at people, we come together, and, and, and it influences our relationships in the church when we have the joy that he puts in our heart. He puts a melody in our hearts. And with that song comes thankfulness. And so when we come to the table, look around at the people you come with because we need to thank God for one another, to delight to, as you greet people and see that we come together, you need to say, thank, thank, I, I'm thankful for, for this person. I'm thankful for those that you've given me to come together and worship with. You know, he, he puts a song in our heart. And today, even as we encourage one another, we can, we can know that this passage calls us to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk in wisdom, and to walk in the joy of the glory of Christ in the church. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, thank you for the church. Thank you that this is a place of, of uh, love and light and wisdom and joy. Lord, it's only because of your son, Jesus Christ, that we can, we can come here to learn how to more successfully grow and be sanctified to become more conformed to the image of your son. So Lord, thank you that you put joy in our hearts even as we pursue you. And God, I thank you for this church and the important role it plays in Pittsburgh to be a light to the nations. God, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to wait upon you as we continue to worship now through the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
To come to the Lord's table is to walk a path of love. To walk towards the table is to walk in light with wisdom, to walk in joy. And so I would remind you that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it. And in like manner, he also took the cup, pouring it out, declaring, this is the cup of the new covenant established in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we declare the Lord's death. We also declare the truth. We also have the opportunity to remember all that he did in order that we might walk in love, in light, wisdom, and in joy. As we pray, I'd like to invite our elders to come, and I'll invite you to bow your heads and your hearts with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we do give you thanks for this meal, a meal that accompanies the preaching of your word we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we come this day. You would help us to remember all that you did in order that we might have the light and be the light and to share the love of Christ with others, that we might be able to declare the wisdom and the power of Christ who gave his life on the cross so that others might enter into joy. Would you bless us now as we come, as we feast, and as we rejoice. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we will come by rows. If you are not able to come for any particular reason, please let your neighbor know. And our elders will be happy to serve you in the pew. This is the Lord's table. It is open to all those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have faith on him to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But now all has been made ready, and so you come.
Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this feast. We thank you that in it we find salvation. We see the body broken. We see the blood that has been poured out. We come and we feast on the real presence of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are nourished. We enter into joy. We give you thanks. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us now as we go from this place to be the church, to be a church that walks in love and light and wisdom and joy, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are lost. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this unique moment in history in which you are bringing the nations to us, even here in Pittsburgh, and how we as a congregation, as the church, have the opportunity to share, to share the gospel, to share our lives which have been transformed by grace, to share your love for the world. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me as we close our time together singing the threefold amen. We have the opportunity one more time to practice our parts. If you would turn to Psalm 126, we will sing verse 2 of When Zion's Fortunes God Restored. you that we have the opportunity to enjoy fellowship at Linger Longer after the service. Find Scott Boyd. He'll be happy to talk to you more about uh, PRISM and our partnership. Again, we're grateful to have you with us today. But now go out into the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again. And then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, I wanna encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.